Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to the, our session on building interactive web apps using the JavaScript API's geometry engine. That's a mouthful. Um, before we get started, I just want a show of hands. How many of you have used the geometry engine? All right. How many of you have been to this session before? Great, nobody, because it's exactly the same as last year. So <laughs> I was going to tell you to leave <laughs> if you've uh, uh, been here before. Um, by way of introduction, I'm Christian Ekinis. I'm a product engineer on the JavaScript API. I, uh, jo the Geometry Engine hasn't changed much in the, uh, at all, really, right? No, in the last cool. couple of years. Um, so I just build apps, demoing things for it. Um, not much testing left. Okay. This is Dave. Uh, my name's Dave Bayer. I also wor work in the um, Arc uh, ArcGIS JavaScript API team. Um, and I worked on integrating the geometry engine into the API. So, and as Christian says, it hasn't changed, changed much this, in the last couple of years. So. But it doesn't make it less cool. <laughs> so, just to give you a heads up of what we're talking about, um, we're going to give you an overview of the operations available in the geometry engine. And then uh, throughout that process, I'll be flipping back and forth quite a bit between the slides and the demos to show you kind of how some of those, those operations work in demos, live demos. Um, so that'll take up probably the first half of our session. Then I'll hand over to Dave and he'll talk about, get kind of into the weeds of what's going on in the geometry engine, some of the internals, um, some of the things it does well for you, and also um, maybe some of the things that um, you want to be aware of when you're with the geometry engine. So um, maybe there's cases that you should not be using it. So he'll talk about some of that, and, uh, and that's, that's how we'll actually end up. And we'll go ahead and dive right in. So, as you can predict, the geometry engine is all about geometry. Uh, points, lines, polygons, that's classic GIS lingo. Um, it's really, uh, th this is, I guess, the GIS developer's uh, way to geek out when it comes to creating custom apps uh, using these, these geometry, uh, geometry operations. Uh, it's these types of operations that really, uh, got me excited about GIS when I first was studying it, so um, I'm still excited about these types of things. There's, I think, about 32 functions in the Geometry Engine. We actually have two modules. In the API, we have a synchronous version and an async version. Uh, Dave will talk about the differences between those two. But all the functions in uh, the sync version are going to be in the async version as well. And we like to classify these functions into different categories just to make it easier to understand uh, all the things you can do with Geometry Engine. So the first category is our geometry operations, or I like to think of these as testing functions. So they all return Boolean values, true, false. So do these two polygons overlap? Does this line cross this polygon? Or are these two geometries equal to one another? Is one within another one, or do they intersect? These are common GIS operations that your users um, uh, will likely be familiar with. So I'm going to switch over to show you a, a really quick demo of how this can work in just a really simple editing app. This is not really a true editing app. It's just a drawing app. But imagine that you have a user who wants to digitize or edit streets, and you provide them with this app, and they can start you know, adding street features. But imagine that uh, you have certain topological rules, such as two segments cannot cross one another. You can use the geometry engine to prevent them from doing so. So in this case, once I cross a line, I cannot continue it. However, I can continue doing all this stuff, but then once I cross, it won't continue the line, and it won't even let me finish it until I double click and it, and it meets the rules that I set up for it. All that's doing is while I'm drawing that line, I can take that last segment 
and test it against the rest of the line and say, does this intersect this line? And if it's true, then I'm going to prevent them from even continuing the draw. Overlay operations. So union, symmetric difference, clip, and intersection. These can be extremely powerful in allowing, and both editing apps and, all, and other kinds of applications as well, such as maybe you do some, a little bit of client-side analysis, allowing the user to explore certain aspects of your data, maybe how two different geometries interact with one another, and you want to see um, what, what exactly they, they would look like if you were to do like a, a difference or maybe an intersection. So I'll flip back over. Again, another, dem uh, another editing demo here. So I, th this is close to my hometown. I grew up in rural eastern Washington. Uh, some apple orchards out there. And let's say I have a parcel of land and I want to add to it or, uh, or maybe cut it up and change the features. So I created this application. This doesn't do true editing. It does client-side editing, but I'm not actually pushing edits up to the server, though you can, actu you can more than, you can do that by all means. So in this case, I select a feature and I have the cut operation selected. So I'm going to go ahead and start drawing. And you don't see anything special here until I actually cross. And you'll see how interactive this is. Once I cross my cutting line, I can immediately see what these polygons would look like when they're cut. And I also can see the areas update on the fly. So very fast performance. We're making no trips to the server because the geometry engine executes all these operations on the client. So if I finish that and then I keep cutting, I can continue that process. Note that you can do other things like merge features. So let's say I didn't really want to cut those two in half. I can click one, merge it with the other one. Note that when I do this cut operation that I am not doing just a cut on the geometry, with the geometry engine. I'm actually doing, I believe, six different operations all at the same time. Right now, every time I move my mouse, I am testing the location of that point with the polygon I selected. So first of all, I'm saying, is this location of the cursor within the polygon? If it's not, then I'm not going to try to attempt a cut. It doesn't make sense. If it is, what about the cutting line? Does it completely cross my polygon? If it does not, I'm not going to attempt the cut, and I'm not going to attempt a measure. So in this case, one is returning true, one is returning false, and it's not going to perform a cut, otherwise it would give me an error. Once, I, once both of those conditions are true, then I can perform other operations. So there's four more going on here. One, I'm actually performing the cut operation, so I get two different polygons. And then the other operations are area calculations. So I'm calculating the geodesic area of each of those, um, si uh, one right after the other, but it looks like it's simultaneous. And then I'm also doing an offset. That's just for visual purpose purposes, though you can certainly use it for actual editing reasons as well. So that's what those purple dashed lines are doing. I'm offsetting just for, to make a visual, to make it look like I'm editing this currently. Also, you can set up rules for adding features. So, you know, standard adding a feature, yay, that works. But what about, what if a user says, oh, I want to try to add an orchard inside another orchard? Then you could prevent them from doing so, say, nope, you can't do that. That's not allowed. But you can make it easy for them, so if they border and they, sh they, share a, a, they have a shared border with a, with a neighboring orchard, you could do something like, okay, I'm going to go inside here, and that way I want to be able to cut it so it, it respects the topology of what I want. So it, compl it shares that border, and I don't have any slivers or overlapping lines or anything like that, no islands. And then you can create a pretty cool interactive editing application that uh, will make the editing experience nicer for your users. So then there's topological correctness. So we're talking about simplification. So this 
to understand this, you have to understand the, what the geometries look like. Polygons are composed of one or more rings. So you can have a multi-part poly polygon. And to be topologically correct, those rings um, should not be intersecting, per se. And same thing with the polyline. You can have multiple paths to make a multi-part polyline. So, so in the case of this one, let's see if I can refresh here. So let's say you have another simple editing app and the user is drawing and how many times we see things like this where they intersect in places they shouldn't and maybe they're really tired and you know making geometries that don't make sense they finish it and you can test and say hey this is not a simplified geometry this is not going to work for for our purposes so you can pass it through the simplify function and get back the number of rings that, that makes sense. And then there's other operations such as getting the nearest coordinate or a vertex. This is most easily demoed in the context of snapping. So you see here I'm, I'm searching for the nearest vertex of this polygon so you can create uh, a method for allowing the user to snap to the nearest vertex. But you can also use the coordinate to make it smoother so it's just the nearest coordinate of the polygon. So you see it doesn't snap to the vertex, it's just the nearest um, coordinate, I guess. And then there are measurement operations, length and area. And notice that we break them up into two parts. There's geodesic length and planar length. So those of you who are unaware, the world is round, and maps do not reflect the roundness of the Earth very well, especially web maps, particularly Web Mercator. It's an awful projection. Jeez, this keeps cutting out. It's an awful projection, and so it makes for highly distorted shapes and very inaccurate area measurements and line measurements, of course. So this app is just, it's just intended to be educational. So Web Mercator uh, is only, measurements are only accurate on the equator. That's the line of tangency. So if I draw on the equator, and I want to measure, I can see that my, the, in, in this case, I'm measuring a long distance, 10,500 miles or so, and the measurement is the true distance um, is only off by less than a mile, which is quite remarkable, actually. But once you venture north or south of the equator, you see how that difference changes quite a bit. That's because the further you get away from the equator, the more distorted your distances and measurements become. That's why we have the geodesic measurements. And you might naturally ask, well, why in the world would you give us planar measurements if they're that bad everywhere in Web Mercator? And the answer is, well, not all of you are using Web Mercator. Some of you are using um, state plane projections. Some of you are using uh, NAD83 projections or UTM. And, and that's great. That's what you should be doing. And in those cases, the geodesic function is not supported. It's only supported in using WGS84 and Web Mercator. So in the case of projected coordinate systems other than Web Mercator, you should be using the planar method. And that will give you a pretty, a pretty accurate result, as accurate as the projection, I should say. It's not going to be perfect. This is, isn't even completely perfect, but it's pretty darn close. So you can see as you get further and further north, the worse and worse your measurement gets. And even if you zoom in to say, a much, much larger scale. While the actual measurement says, oh, this is only off by 0 0.7 miles, that's pretty significant when you're only measuring a third of a mile. So it's just something to be aware of. And last, well, not, this isn't last, but close to last, is buffering. The very, very common uh, geometry operation, uh, 
I don't know how anyone could get past the GIS 101 course without knowing what this is, but it's the same exact concept. You have a planar and a geodesic version of this. And so I'll show you a 3D application, well, an application that has a, a 2D view and a 3D view to show you the difference between the two. So in the left, you see the 2D view, and I'm doing, executing a geodesic buffer and in both views. You'll notice that in the 3D view, it looks like a perfect circle, but in the 2D view, it starts to look like an egg shape, and as you get towards the North Pole, it kind of takes on this wave function. That's again because of the, the, the projection of Web Mercator is affecting it that way, but that's the actual, dis that's the true geodesic distance or buffer when you buffer out. I believe this is 500 kilometers or something like that. But notice that in the scene view, it's gonna look like a regular circle, and that's because it's much closer approximation to the actual shape of the Earth. And notice how responsive this is. This is not making any request to the server so I can, I can do those operations very quickly. And finally, we have just other operations that are harder to classify. <laughs> so there's um, densification, uh, geodesic densify, convex hole, rotate, flip. Uh, some of the lesser common uh, operations you have available to you. That image down um, on the bottom uh, was an interesting case where uh, when we first released our 3D API, so we got several bug reports where people were trying to create a line like this, and they would have a, two vertexes or two vertices, an ending point and a starting point, spanning the globe, and they would create a polyline, and it would look just like that red line. It would go straight through, and they say, hey, you got a bug in your API, this isn't working. And while that isn't necessarily the best developer experience, per se, when you just give us two coordinates, like there are two vert ver vertices, we don't exactly know how to draw that line. So it's treating this like a projected coordinate system. So it's just saying, okay, I'm gonna get the shortest distance or the shortest path between these two points. So naturally, we're gonna go through the Earth. Um, when in reality, what you might want is that curve going offset on the same, the, by the same distance from, or at the same elevation. And that's what geodesic densify helps you out with. It will add vertices at certain segment um, uh, tolerances, and you can, and that will automatically pick up that Z value from those two vertices. So that's true for 2D as well. You'll see the nice great circle arc along that. And just one final demo before I pass over to Dave. So this is a 3D app. Uh, it's just for fun, really. Uh, there's an API for requesting the location of the International Space Station. So I thought, why not make a simple app to track its location? And then maybe we could do some geometry operations to approximate the speed. So if I click Start Tracking, it'll put me at the location of the International Space Station. As I zoom out a little bit, you'll kind of see it moving slowly. But it makes a request every second, updates the location, and it will calculate the geodesic distance and accumulate it, and then I approximate the speed. And sure enough, the actual speed of the International Space Station is about seven kilometers per second. And so you'll see here in the network traffic, if I click one of these requests, all I'm getting is this ISS position, so lat long, and I'm just constructing a polyline and I'm calculating that speed on the fly. So those are just a few examples of how the geometry engine can help you and how you can build interactive applications using standard geometry uh, operations that uh, your users may wanna see in their apps. And again, it becomes particularly powerful when it comes to editing scenarios. So I'm gonna pass over to Dave to talk about um, to talk about what he has to talk about. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, um, those of you who have been using the um, JavaScript API for a, a number of years will realize that for, for the last 10 years you've been able to do geometry operations. You've been able to call into the geometry service um, and perform intersections, union differences, nearly all the functions um, that Christian has just showed you. 
And so what's important to see is the difference between the geometry engine and the geometry service. And that difference is the user interaction. So if we look at what a typical call to the geometry service is, um, we take the geometries that you've got in the browser and we encode those as JSON. We then send those over the network to a geometry server. And that geometry server is um, getting requests from lots of different clients. So your, your request will um, be received and processed um, as soon as the um, geometry server can. It will run the operation. It will then encode it back into JSON and send that traffic back um, over the network where we'll decode the response and then you can um, do what you want to do with it, whether it's being putting it on the map and so forth. And all of those processes, the, the timings, by the way, are completely made up. There's so many variables involved um, that it's impossible to actually give a consistent view of how long that process will take. Um, it will depend on the, you know, the latency of your network, how busy the geometry server is, and how complex your geometries are, how much actual, what's the payload that's being sent up to the service. Um, to get really good interactivity, um, you really want to be sub sort of sub 500 milliseconds. And that's really where the, um, where the geometry service, sorry, the geometry engine, the client side geometry engine is, you know, is coming into its own. And, you know, and simply put, it's literally because the geometry engine is all running client side. We can just take the geometries, take them through the geometry engine and get the result. So um, if I sort of go back to one of Christian's demos, the Apple Orchard demo, I've got a different version of that demo, which this one is actually showing the number of requests that are being saved by using the client side geometry engine. So if I start, if I select the feature and start cutting it, do you see in the bottom corner, those are the number of network requests. So I've already made 1,700 network requests if I'd been using the geometry service. And you just really couldn't get that kind of interactivity through con making constant network calls. Not to mention the person running the geometry service might not be best pleased that they're being, having so much traffic going through it. So if I go back to the slide deck, you know, another thing to look at is how you write apps with the geometry engine. Now, I was quite surprised just how many hands went up um, who, uh, who's been using the geometry engine. So most of this will be very familiar to you. Um, I mean, Basically, working with the geometry engine is as simple as, as loading the geometry module and then making calls against it. So here, we're doing a buffer. We're AMD loading the geometry engine, taking the point, and buffering it by 10 miles. And you instantly get a result. And that's a synchronous operation all happening at the same time. So it's really a very, very simple API. And with the API, we went and had a look at all of the other SDKs and how their geometry engines have been exposed. And we tried very much to get the same semantics and the same style of calling convention. There are some subtle differences, but for the most part, we've tried to get that same, same feel to them. And you can compare that to, the, um, to calling the geometry service. Now, with the 4.x API, things are a bit easier as so you've got auto casting. But effectively, with the geometry service, you still AMD load the geometry service into your, into your application. But you then have to create buffer parameters, fill in, fill in all the properties. Then you make a call. The call is making a network request. So you have a call back. And when you get the call back, um, you, can, you can sort of work with it as you would before. So you know, it's worth saying that using the geometry service does, sorry, using the client side geometry engine does simplify your code. But it doesn't mean less code is being run. The geometry engine is a very large module, and it's running an awful lot of code to do those geometry operations. So it's a very large module that you're going to be downloading into your client application. Now, even in this demo, we've already seen two editing applications. And I've worked for Esri for a number of years, and I, I, I have lost count of the number of editing applications I've built. So. Um, what I thought I'd do is show you how we could go about building an editing application with using the geometry engine. So if I open up my browser again, 
And here is my simple, simple um, editing application. With it, I can create a new feature. And then I can start using the actual operation. So I can append to that feature. And you can see the operation happened instantly. It's still going to be writing that to the server, but instantly I got the change of the operation. I can subtract from it. I can split it. And I can equally take the, oh, take the bits that I've split and merge them again. So all of these operations have happened very quickly and very simply um, in, in, the, in the application. But I can also do, do further things. I can start rotating the features. And that's, that's a method in the geometry engine. I can grow the feature by, I have no idea how many meters that is. Um, but very simply, I can work with it. I can shrink it, as well, I shrink it as well. And lastly, if I were to create a new feature, I could put on a measuring environment. And as I go along, I can get measurements as I'm digitizing a feature. And all of that's doing offsets um, and, and distance calculations as I use the, use the application. Now, it's worth going in to see how that application has been built. So if I open up the application, now, I know this is a JavaScript course, but this has actually been written in TypeScript. Um, but the semantics of the, uh, are the same. And if I look here, oh, how do I make it bigger? Any idea? Oh. Yeah, there you go. Oh. oh, how do I shrink it? Yeah. Right, I'm on this. Hello. Okay. Um, if I look at this, the operations have all been separated out into individual classes. And this application is using the drawing manager and it's wiring up the on draw event handle to actually do the operation. But if you look at the amount of code that's going on in an append, it's literally using the geometry engine and unioning the current selected geometry with the geometry that's come from the drawing manager. Then it's setting the feature shape and applying the edits. That's just three lines of code to do a very simple operation. And nearly all of the operations are the same. If I look at the effects item, the shrink is just doing a negative buffer. The grow is obviously doing a positive buffer. And the rot rotate is also similarly working with the rotate oper operation. So very quickly, you can build those kind of user interactivity experiences and then use the methods to very quickly perform the operations. Merge is slightly more complicated as you have to loop through all the selected features, building up an array of geometries. But then you can just do a union and you have your new feature. And then again, it's more complicated because you have to delete all the other features and put the new union featured back on the map. Um, similarly, split, um, you have to do a, we here it's simplifying the code in case they digitized wrongly. So that's making sure it's um, topologically correct. And then one side you do a difference and the other side you do an intersect. And that gives you either side of the, of the split operation. So I'm actually going to pass back to um, Christian to give a demo of building an, uh, an analysis app. All right. So let's go ahead and go over here. Some of you, many of you, have actually asked, can I use, can I do 3D geometry operations with the geometry engine? And the answer is no. You cannot do 3D buffers. You can't do 3D intersects um, or other 3D operations. However, you can kind of fake it. So I created this app last week um, in an effort to try to see what I can do with analysis and geometry engine. So what you're looking at here, this is actually just polygon data. It's not mesh data or 3D data, true 3D data, but it's polygon data that has 3D attributes. What this is, is it's a layer of military training routes. And what these are used for in the land development world are, if I have a project proposal, I want to see if my, the project height, um, 
is going to interfere with any of these military training routes. And these essentially are just designated airspace for the military that you cannot encroach upon. And common thing to check, but you can build a 3D anal uh, app that allows you to get a quick analysis of whether or not your project is going to encroach on this land. So we're in northeastern Arizona here, and you'll notice that there's various heights and different uh, levels of depth with each of these, these zones. So I'm going to have a fake project area. Let's say I have a proposal to uh, uh, build a wind farm somewhere in Arizona. So let's download a CSV file. So I have fake windmill locations that I'm going to just drag and drop in my scene view here. What that does is once I drag and drop it, I take a height attribute for each of those windmills and I'm going to do a query against the scene, the, the CSV layer on the client and find what the maximum height is of each of those windmills. And that is displayed here in the input element you see in the top right. And so with that, I have buffers using the geometry engine. I don't visualize them here, but, I, but they're buffered and different rings. And then I check whether they intersect at different heights with these uh, train MTRs or, or military training routes. If the height or the location, or the, sorry, the height and the location intersect within 100 feet of one of these zones, it's considered a high risk for encroachment. If it's within 200 feet, it's medium risk and 300 feet low. And if it doesn't intersect in any of those ways or in just one of those ways, it doesn't have any any risk at all. So you can even do something cool like change the base map, zoom down to the level, and symbolize your turbines with these cool 3D web style symbols that we have in the API. And you can even allow the user to change the height, say um, these are actually going to be 300. So let's rerun our client side analysis and whoops, we see another high risk for encroachment. Or Maybe you go a little lower and see how that changes. So how's that done? So let me navigate over here. That is all happening actually within the renderer of that layer. So I have an initial render when I was using kind of that blue wireframe approach. That's what this is here. But when I do this create classification, what I'm, the, I call two parameters. One is getting the project geometry. In this case, it's point locations. I also have the option for polygons. And then a project height, which I got from the CSV data. And then he, these are the different risk levels I could change um, in the application. So I go through each of those levels and call the geodesic buffer and and buffer each of those points based on that risk level. So now I have three different sets of buffers. Then there is this function called classify features. That is going to be passed into a unique value renderer. And basically what that function does is it's going to analyze those points and say, OK, if this is going to cause a high risk for encroachment, let's, get, let's return high. And then we'll give it a red symbol if it returns medium, orange, low, yellow, and so on. So what's going on within that function? Notice that this is set on the field property, so it's a little confusing. So it goes through each feature in my MTR layer, the polygons that are floating above the earth, and it's getting the ceiling value and the floor value. This is the bottom elevation and the top elevation. And then I have the geometry as well as the restriction level. So I'm going to go through each of those levels, those risk levels, and I'm going to get that buffer value, be it 300, 200, or 100. And then I'm going to check if there's any risk for height. So this is where I alluded to the fact I'm faking uh, 3D geometry here. I'm checking for a height intersection. All I'm doing is using the attribute value. So this is, so to speak, your 3D buffer, poor man's 3D buffer. So I have the lower elevation, and I'm going to subtract based on that buffer value. So let's say subtract it by 100 feet. And then if that height of the feature is greater than that lower elevation, it's going to intersect it. But that's not good enough. 
if the geometry also uh, intersects the buffer, then that's when we're going to be concerned. So that's what this risk attribute does. By default, it's none, but it will assign it the proper value if there is uh, two intersections by height and by the XY value. So that's just one example of something you could do with client side analysis uh, using Geometry Engine. And that's in a 3D app. So that's pretty cool that you can do that. Okay. So far, we've been um, talking about the synchronous Geometry Engine. But there is actually two client side Geometry Engines. We have an asynchronous version. And the asynchronous version basically uses web workers to perform the operations on in the background, so they don't block the UI thread. Um, and that's the main benefit, is that you can uh, have greater throughput, you can put a lot of um, geometry operations all through the, um, the, the asynchronous geometry engine, and then they all run in, in parallel. Another sort of side benefit is that it's easiest to substitute the geometry service, because both of them are, synchronous, are asynchronous operations. The downside is that not all browsers um, support web workers. However, um, I know that you're talking about browsers probably older than three years old. So with most, most modern web browsers will have no problem with web workers. So the coding pattern is, is very similar. We've tried to keep the interfaces as much as possible uh, to be the same between the client side version, sorry, the the synchronous version and the asynchronous version. So here, the same buffer command is running with the same parameters. The only difference is, at the end, you get a promise, which you have to wait to resolve to get the value back. And one of the things, I'm just going to quickly show you a, a demo of how the sort of asynchronous geometry um, pattern can, can help. So if I go back to my browser. And in this demo, I'm going to create 500 buffers. So these are 500 points. And one side is going to do that using the asynchronous geometry um, engine. And the other side is going to use the geometry service. So if I click Create Buffers, um, what's happening now is it's actually already executed. Um, it took 1.048 seconds to buffer 500 points and um, to transmit all of that to the web worker and to get it back. Now. I never know what to say at this point because it typically takes about 28 seconds for, for this operation to run. So we could have a countdown, but any second now this should finish. Ah, oh, it, that's, a, that's a record, 25 seconds. Um, but it shows that the, you know, one side is sending a, transmitting a tremendous amount of data over the network to be processed. And it's probably really that network latency that is really the, the killer, because it's taking 500 points, sending them up, and then buffered points are actually a lot of extra vertices. So I'm going to completely um, change um, tack now and sort of answer the question, what is the geometry engine doing for me? And really, this section, I want to go through some of the um, some of the things that you might not realize are going on in the geometry engine when you use it. So one of the first concepts to understand is um, spatial tolerance. So every coordinate system has a spatial tolerance. And that's the, the tolerance where, say, take two points, the distance between those two points, where it doesn't make mathematical sense for them to be treated as different points. And different coordinate systems will have different tolerance where the maths is affected to such a degree that those two points for all intents and purposes are the same. And what the geometry engine does for you is it does something called cracking and clustering. Where it sees, sorry, where it sees two points that are actually the same point, or effectively the same point, it will merge them together and cluster them together into one. Where points are so close to the line um, that, they f that they are effectively touching, um, it will actually introduce vertices um, where those points should be. And that, that's a real benefit. All of the geometry engines in, um, across all of the SDKs and APIs do this um, uh, cracking and clustering and taking into account spatial tolerance. Now, it has some strange effects. 
So here I have two points that are infinitesimally close together. Um, I don't know how many decimal places there are, but that one on the end there is the only difference between these two points. If you were to mathematically you just go, or using JavaScript, just compare the X and the Y, you would treat those two points as differently. But if you use the geometry engine and do an equals, it will tell you that for all intents and purposes, those points are the same. So it's a real benefit of using the geometry engine that you know it'll be taking into account the coordinate system that you're, that you're working with. I just want to sort of also say a bit about what's going on in the geometry engine. I mentioned that it was using web workers, but it didn't create 500 web workers when it was, when it was doing that operation. Instead, what we have is it will lazily create new web workers up to a maximum. Uh, so we ha effectively creating a pool of web workers. Um, the actual number of web workers it will create will depend on the, on the browser that is running in and the context that is running. So mobile devices will create less um, web workers compared to sort of desktop browsers. And what happens is, is when you call an operation, your, your operation is put onto a queue. And as soon as a web worker is available, it will pick up the next item in the queue, process it, and then post the result back to you. So it's just worth understanding that you can push a lot of things through, through the, geom the asynchronous geometry engine, but you are in a queue. So each, one, each operation, you know, if you put 10,000, you'll have to wait, and you then want to know what's happened to your, um, th your next one. You'll have to wait for all of them to be serviced before it comes through. So it's probably also worth talking about the limitations of the geometry engine. Now, I didn't know in the plenary that they were going to announce the projection support. I didn't think that was being released for a while yet. So, so this slide is now slightly out of date, but it's still, actually, no, it's still current at the moment. But with the projection engine, some of this will be changing. Because the geometry engine currently doesn't have um, a projection engine, it means that certain operations will not work unless you're in Web Mercator or a geographic coordinate system. So all of the operations that are doing geodesic area, geodesic length, and geodesic buffer will only work if you're in, that, in one of those two coordinate systems. We've made a special case for Web Mercator where we've put the maths in because it's such a common requirement to go from Web Mercator and actually do a geodesic area. With the new projection engine, it's very likely that you will still need to project before you can call these operations. So we're still debating whether, the project, whether we should change the geometry engine to automatically project for you. Um, so the, the balance of opinion is probably no, you want to be very explicit when you want to do a projection rather than have it happen automatically for you. So a common question that we're asked is um, when should you use the geometry engine? And the, you know, the surprise, well, probably not unsurprising answer is, is not all of the time. There are very specific trade-offs about when you should use the geometry engine. It's a very large AMD module that you'll be bringing down. So if you're only going to run a couple of, um, couple of operations, it's going to be worth just using the geometry service. You know, so that, that's one factor that you might want to um, consider. Projection support is another factor why you might want to use the geometry service. Um, network connectivity, if you're on a, on a poor network um, or, have lo um, or offline, you might want to use the client-side geometry engine. The least good reason for using the geometry engine is the ease of coding, um, but it is easier to, to work with than, than creating um, calls to the geometry service. It is also worth pointing out that the geometry service does have operations that, that the client-side geometry engine doesn't have. So it's all about deciding for your app what the trade-offs are and what's, what's important for your app. So I'm going to pass over to Christian, who's going to run through some resources. All right. Well, that concludes the demos and our discussion of or demonstration of Geometry Engine. But I want to point you out to some additional resources available to you. Um, we can't talk about every possible thing there is to talk about Geometry Engine, but we have written about it, and so we encourage you to go read about it. So two and a half years ago, I wrote these blog posts, which you know, if it's two and a half years old, you would naturally think these are out of date. But as Dave said, nothing's changed. So 
these are still relevant. You can check out these blog posts where I go through each, I do a three part series. And so I go through the testing of spatial rel relationships and editing apps. So you can look at what I did to build that editing application with the orchards. We talk about the async versus synchronous version of the geometry engine. And then the next part, I talk about measurement. Oh, I'm sorry. There we go. So this is the first part here. And then the second part, we talk about measurement. And so I go through uh, different apps. Some of these you haven't seen today. This is the 2D version. This, I believe, was before we released. Uh, oh, it looks like we had 4.0 beta 1 at the time. Um, so there was a 3D version of the API, but I used 2D in that case. And I talk about that, that measurement app I just showed you. And even some other ones where I use projected coordinate systems to compare the differences of the measurements with geometry service and the geometry engine. And then there's the third part which talks about overlay. So there's this application which I have in my repo here. I didn't demo it today but you can by all means take a look at all the operations that went in there along with these helpful code snippets that will show you what went into it. Repo I was just talking about is this one. This is the, this will contain all of the demos that you just saw today. So please uh, go visit it, take a look at the code, uh, search for geometry engine within the code so you can uh, learn what patterns we used and how you can build some of these interactive maps. And I will switch over to the PowerPoint. And you'll see the links to those blogs and those resources on, on this final slide. And before I close, I just want to encourage you to take our survey and tell us how we did as presenters. Tell us if this content is relevant to your work and uh, let us know how we can improve. And with that, I'll open it up for questions. Yes. So the question is, if you're attempting to use the geometry engine async in a browser that does not support web workers, will it default back to the synchronous version? And Dave will I take can answer that. that. No, it won't. Um, so I'd recommend um, you, um, you, there's lots of libraries, and I think Dojo has a library to detect whether you've got web worker support. So you can very easily test and do an if statement before, but we, haven't put in anything, any smart sort of way of detecting that for you and, and changing the operation. So. Um, so the, the question is can uh, increasing or increasing the tolerance affect the performance? Yep. Um, you don't have access to the tolerance. So we have a, a database of spatial reference tolerances and, and you know, there's, there are, you know, there are a lot of different spatial references and we look that up and, and use it accordingly. So there isn't actually a, a way of getting that tolerance. Now th there is, just to clarify, there are uh, tolerance parameters in some of the methods. Uh, and yes, if you, if you increase the tolerance or, sorry, make them smaller so that you have more vertices, say in geodesic densify, yeah, yeah that's going to sorry, yeah, performance. So not the coordinate system, but yes, yeah. yes, Christian's right. If you're using the densify, those do have tolerances and distances that you can set. This one? Other questions? Oh, yeah. So uh, he's experienced cores issues when using the async geometry engine. In um, the past. No, I'm su I'm surprised by that because it's it's literally just a web worker that loads an AMD module. I mean, if you do experience that, please let us know or raise it with support so that we can can track down that that is the the first time i've heard that as as an issue so so all right thank you for coming out please come up and ask us more questions if you have any
Thanks.